Hi, welcome to another episode of Contest Tech Live. I'm your host, Jeff Baher, along with my assistant, Austin Chen. Joining us today, we have two guests from our partner community, Valentina Ivleba, Head of Data Science and AI for CPG and Retail at EPAM, and Ana Lentigua, Head of Strategic Technology Partners at Aprimo. Ana, Val, welcome to the program. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having us. Maybe we could start, uh, maybe Anna, if you want to start just like with the introduction, uh, a little bit about you know, who you are, your role um, in your company at Primo, and then, um, well, you can do the same. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Anna. I uh, work for Primo. We're the leader in AI-led content operations. Um, so I head up our global strategic partnership program, which means that I work really closely with all of my different clients. Um, so that they're best supported by different solution implementers and other technology vendors as they help shape um, the technology ecosystem that's best suited for their needs. Uh, I also get to work really closely with my different technology partners to bring new innovation to market, which funnily enough, keeps me on my toes almost as much as my clients do. I imagine. Well, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, and I'm with IPAM. IPAM Systems is a global digital transformation services and product engineering company. Um, I'm one of the leaders in our data science practice team, uh, where I wear multiple hats. One of the biggest one is the responsible for thought leadership around the practical use of AI in consumer goods and retail vertical. I actually came into consulting from the industry. And I also lead large AI programs for some of our retail clients, kind of keeping my hands dirty in delivery and Stand a practitioner. Great to see you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you for both bringing your expertise uh, onto the program and onto this topic. So, let's, uh, I know this is a huge topic, but I'd love just from both of your perspectives, uh, maybe Val, if you want to start, like what's help kind of get our heads around kind of like the AI landscape in general with retail? I know there's some kind of odd kind of buzz term things that people are seeing today, but I know it's also broader than that. So, like, how do you kind of see AI from that perspective? It's a great question, Jeff. Um, when you think about the industry that are re really like pushing boundaries of AI, retail may not be the first one that comes to mind, right? Isn't it? It doesn't come up in your head. But being a mature industry, uh, it's very mature industry. Think about, you know, Macy's is 165 years old. North Shore is 120 years old. They've been right there at the cutting edge, an early adopter all along. And retailers and consumer goods companies were among the first to use business intelligence, then advanced analytics, then they started to use AI automation in pretty much every part of their value chain. So today you're going to find AI in intelligent demand forecasting, risk modeling, social listening. They use AI to optimize the distribution, to pick where the next store location should be. Uh, they use AI for smart uh, inventory management and so on. So it's been doing the work, you know, helping them optimize the cost and augment the decision making uh, behind the scenes. Now come 2023, generative AI is all the buzz, it explodes and infects everybody in the industry with some fresh inspiration to innovate, especially around the content strategy and consumer engagement. And I think this is where a lot of work that uh, Anna is doing uh, will be really interesting for you to hear about. Yeah, I'll pick up from there, Val. I mean, what's really interesting is for most applications that we've seen traditionally of AI in retail, you're, you see that you're moving far more towards an accurate forecasting model. So to Val's point with like demand forecasting or automated inventory management, you're always moving more towards that reliable forecasting. But what's really interesting that we're starting to see is with the introduction of Gen AI, that becomes a little bit flipped for the marketing department. Um, so whereas Gen AI is really poised to make our lives a lot easier in many regards. It's also set to make our jobs more difficult in a different way. And one of the ways is that, you know, as we start to move from a world of content scarcity to really content abundance, that also starts changing the way that marketing budgets um, are forecasted and your ability to forecast against them. So, you know, if you think about it from the marketing perspective, Everything that we do in marketing is driven by the cost and skill required to create high quality content, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, when you're thinking of like, okay, how many campaigns can we do? How many different channels are those campaigns going to operate on? How many segments are they being personalized against? Like typically when you're putting together your marketing plan, all of those questions are governed by how many designers we have, how long it could, like takes to create the actual content, um, how big your agency budget is. 
And what's interesting with Gen AI is that when you start to incorporate that into your forecasting model, you know, you could have high quality output from the get-go, which really helps mm-hmm. from that productivity standpoint, but it also might take far more tries than that, like 15x tries or 30 times the tries to create that content that's like really high quality. And what's interesting is even though that's extremely nominal, like when you're using chat GPT, it, the variability around that, what it takes to create high value content will make it so that your ability to budget and forecast becomes a lot more complex for marketing organizations. All right. That's fascinating. So is that, um, I'm maybe to share a, a real world example around that, but is that where, where do you feel with retailers? Cause the like, fall you mentioned like Macy's and Nordstrom, like a pretty established companies. There's obviously a lot that are less so and where are, where are people's head with just kind of what you share there? Is that table stakes for most people or is that one of the big learnings of how to kind of, yeah. I think it's going to be one of the larger like learnings of how do we properly forecast and manage like against our marketing budgets with, as we start to incorporate Gen AI. But I think a really interesting question is like, just from the get-go today, how are different retailers starting to incorporate Gen Gen AI into their content strategy. So Val, I don't know, like, did you have any examples that you want to lead with? Um, Yeah. And I wanted to add a little bit to it. So kind of tell you a bit of a story. Uh, When Microsoft commercialized ChatGPT, making it available to general public, what it did, it showed us people different way to search and consume content, much better way, right? Did gone are the days when it was okay for a consumer to spend 10 minutes on the website, scrolling, playing with search keywords, hoping to find that like perfect t-shirt, right? So the expectations of people have changed uh, with no point of return it, and it's just that good. So since there's no e-commerce without content in search, right, the disruption is inevitable and retailers and consumer brands, they're pretty good at running disruption ways in my experience. So. They're hiring generative AI for hyper-personalization and this feeds into what Anna was saying about content strategies that are now different, right? Um, so I see a lot of this. Uh, they also use it to improve like social listening and demand sensing that we just talked uh, earlier, which enables better segmentation of customers and their needs, right? And that in turn helps design tailored reward structures and loyalty programs, which is a big deal for retailers in 2023. Um, another thing that I see across the board is um, plain English interface to discover products to buy, right? The actual the proper term is semantic search. It's one of the most popular use cases along with the content localization and translation. So I can't wait to see, you know, also voice chatbots to undergo some disruption in this regard. Um, yeah, but these are the most popular uh, sort of use cases that we see with content specifically across the yeah. board. I've been seeing some really interesting ones come up with some of our early adopters uh, um, within like our clientele here at Primo. Uh, So because I had up our technology vendor relationships too, you know, I see this huge onslaught where any vendor out there that touches content is looking at ways of incorporating Gen AI into their system. So you have like, and I know Jeff, you told me to find any acronym. So you have your PIM systems, product information, management systems focused on the product data completeness story, right? quick wins around productivity in that sense. You have your different content management systems that are looking at quick wins around search engine optimization keywords, like quick copyright edits. What we're focused on at a primo is because we're centered around productivity management and digital asset management is how are you taking all of your different swaths of content and then taking everything you know around that content, so all of your content data and using that to train chat GPT for better outputs at the get go. So Uh, Two really interesting use cases that I've seen already incorporated with some of my clients. One of them is financial services, but it still translates very much to everything in retail. Um, It's that quick productivity win and ability to personalize at scale. So they've trained up this little chat GPT extension within their dam on collections of high performing email content and um, email blasts have been sent out in the past that are already brand specific to them and like on point for their tonality. And then what they're having their different email marketing teams do is create the base copy for that, feed it into the chat GPT extension to create 12 different segments per all of their different personalities that they're targeting. So that's like a really quick win kind of use case. It then gets routed off for final approval. So you still have that extra sense, like set of eyes against it before anything gets sent out. Yeah, which is extremely important. 
Um, and then this other really interesting use case that came up with our very, very large retail client. And it's actually one of the ones that uh, Val mentioned earlier. Um, so their product marketing and e-com teams, I think this is so interesting. They trained up ChatGPT on a collection of product-specific content. And then they invited that chatbot in to their campaign ideation and brainstorming session. So it's like their team of product marketers that are sitting there ideating around this campaign that's going out. And <laughs> what they're doing is posing questions and acting like the product has come to life and is sitting there in the room with them answering from the product's own like point of view, right? Oh, um, very cool. Yeah, very super cool. Yeah. yeah, to hear about. But I mean, very cool application. It's a really cool use case. Well, who, um, maybe from a, a persona perspective, so when when this topic of AI, you know, comes up or who are you working with within these organizations? I mean, you mentioned kind of product managers, product marketers, but what's what's kind of the the extent of like who's kind of wrapped their head around it and put it to use? Well, I can, I can start. So, um, you know, the things, the work we do at eBound with AI, um, it's not just with the content, right? So depending on um, who the buyer is and uh, what kind of business problem you're trying to solve, we engage with data science departments or we engage with the digital product leads or with somebody who's in charge of e-commerce so that actually, I think pretty much every five, I know. <laughs> every business just, person yeah. is looking at it and trying to understand what is that that I can do with generative AI that will make my life easier. Uh, and better and um, deliver better consumer experience in the end because that's what they really care about, right? So everyone, um, I know, what about you guys? I was going to say the same thing, Val. That's why I laughed is I was like, yeah, everybody, <laughs> like blanket answer. But um, just like for instance, even internally at a Primo, uh, like our CEO mandated that across every single different department, we all start incorporating Gen AI into our everyday tasks and routines. Um, and seeing the very different use cases that crop up across your different departments, like really sky's the limit on that. I think a lot of people are really focused on just like those initial productivity gains that they can use by incorporating Gen AI into their day-to-day. -day. Um, but yeah, it really does span every single different department. It's fascinating because it's really, it seems like it's just a four or five month kind of storyline. I mean, not, not AI, obviously, right? But really just kind of the Gen I use cases and kind of the buzz around that. But it's it's very eye-opening just in terms of what you share here. The different types of use cases, the different organizations that it's now kind of percolating through. But again, so it's just with, what is it, five, six months under our belt kind of like commercially where people are now kind of trying to make a reality of it kind of in a very pervasive way. And it's it's really interesting observation because generative AI is actually a pretty old field. Like I think I've done my yeah. first project in it in 2014. That was way before GPT architecture was invented. So it's been around there, but Microsoft and OpenAI really opened a can of worms. And uh, I think it was a fantastic move. Um, just revealing for a smartphone, you know, like, oh, you know, there is a better way to do things. Yeah. <laughs> so we had... Um... You know, on one level was just to, which we did, like, it was a really good sense for, and even just here, like the, how extensive kind of AI is, the fact that it isn't just all based on three or four months rather, but there's like, as you just said there, like many, many years worth of kind of um, research and kind of development into what this, what in the many different ways it is and how it can be applied in different industries. Uh, and we talked about some of the use cases, some of the practical steps. So maybe we can just like dive into that just a, a little bit more and maybe just be focused on the Gen AI kind of use cases specifically, but just how for end users out there um, that are mostly kind of, let's say, in the business of digital experiences, right? Like how how, do, how can they think about maybe both the back-end operations, front-end operations, but where can they, how can they kind of structure some like these are some use cases I should be starting to think about or these are some practical steps I can take because it still kind of feels like oh there's the sky's the limit you can do this you can do that like where where and I know like on you give us a good well like where I can see like some practical measurable gains see the needle moving on a little bit uh, 
Do you want to kick off or do you want me to? Sure. Um. <laughs> I mean, no, it's all tied to. So, I mean, a lot of you started initially with backend operations and, and a lot of things that, yeah, maybe we're like, well, we didn't really think about that in the context of a digital experience, but any well, which, yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Bell. We, um, we attended a conference back in March, a um, retail conference called, um, Oh my God, I'm blanking in, uh, in, in Vegas, where all the retailers and CPG companies get together. Shop talk. Uh, yeah. Shop talk. Thank <laughs> you. That was grocery shop is coming. <laughs> glitching. You know, my robot is glitching. Um, and uh, it was all the buzz. And we had uh, investors coming in and private equity firms sharing their perspective uh, as well on, you know, general potential and what do you really start from. And what I've heard throughout that conference is that companies are trying to figure out the economical way to use GPT because it was so fresh. The um, the value proposition wasn't clear, like it all looked really appealing, but, you know, is it really worth the effort? And for example, like training, training, uh, large language models at the heart of GPT are expensive, not anymore, but these are all these kind of questions. So when our clients look at that, you know, the first thing that when they identify the use cases, they were trying to kind of place them in, you know, in economical lands and see what, what is the possible uh, value. Um, when clients talk to me, I usually guide them with the, you know, two questions, like think about the scale, think about the data. Because scale matters big time uh, when you're deciding on a certain use case. Productivity is a no-brainer. By all means, mm -hmm. get productive right away. Just be mindful about sharing confidential data and do some fact check. You know the responses, but go for it. Yes. So if you use GPT to help write a brief that the brand manager will review before hitting send, you know, fantastic. Go with it. It impacts the work experience of that particular person. That person is in full control. Right, there's no risk and it's amazing. Now, when you want to recruit generative AI to write personalized mailers that will be blasted automatically, it's important, automatically by the company marketing edge to millions of people, that's a challenge of a whole different scale and requires mm -hmm. much more complex and careful solution. And that's why economical lens, when you look at the, you know, doing something at scale might be a bit different. So scale matters when you think about, you know, the use case. Think about right away as it will greatly influence your approach, your timelines, your course, your architecture, and how far you want to push it. Um, and the two other things is you need to consider applying responsible AI best practices from day one. Because again, you know, AI can be biased and you need to actually take some effort to make sure it's ethical and represents your brand values and not making some mistakes that will offend your people, right? That you serve with the help of these solutions. And, um, I think my last word of advice, don't do it alone. Uh, bring in partners, uh, especially those that have, you know, subject matter expertise and let's say natural language processing to assist uh, when you work on solutions that uh, you're going to push at scale. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, I completely reiterate everything that Val said, and I've been seeing the same within my client base. I've been, uh, I've been joining our uh, CEO is he's been giving these different Gen AI briefings to some of our largest clients. And regardless of whatever industry and vertical they're in, every single one of them seems to be following a similar pattern um, when it comes to like first setting up a Gen AI kind of task force, force with representatives from different departments on them um, and using that task force to create a policy that they put in place across the org of how employees can responsibly use Gen AI in their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, and then to Val's point, the third uh, piece of the puzzle is really identifying several, because everybody's like, where do we even start, right? So identifying several low risk, high opportunity proof of concepts of Gen AI application so that you can take that and do internal evangelism against it, showcase the ROI of it. Like Val's examples, right, are very different between the generation of a campaign brief that has an additional set of eyes on it and a checkpoint before it's marched against versus going and blasting out this email to all of your different consumer base um, and not having like any stop gate in between it. Um, actually, the same client that's doing that interesting use case with the product chatbot 
if they incorporated something where they wanted to set up a like checkpoint within a primo. So using your technology stack that you already have as well to kind of help enforce the policy that you put in place. Um, so they're using a primo as kind of like their policy enforcer to flag content that has been gen AI influenced. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily like a slap on the wrist for employees. You don't want to do that because it's not something to be scared of. It just needs to be something that you have the proper protocols in place for. So if it has been gen AI influenced, having that route back to the original creator, having them the way that this uh, client is doing it, is they're having that employee then tag whatever system they use, like whether that's stable diffusion, chat GPT, et cetera. And then that goes through automatically um, one more additional workflow for just a quick approval process so that you make sure you have kind of that the human eyes on it before it gets sent out to the public facing side. The task force part is is particularly intriguing, I think, is that maybe it's something that people might think is a step that you could skip inadvertently or um but it seems especially like any example like super critical, right? That there is some governance and oversight and some course setting right for Well, and that's the thing is that like I guarantee you across every single organization that step has already been skipped over because there's plenty of people within your org that are already seeing Gen AI in their day to day. So really, it's like taking that step back that Val spoke to and like making sure that you have the proper policies in place to march against. Um, yeah, that needs to be the first step for for most organizations, but it's already happening. So <laughs> you need to get in front of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What um, in terms of crystal ball, right? What's what's coming, right? I mean, this is we've obviously, obviously seen so many advances just in these last five, six months of people now using it commercially. Like what? Where are you kind of seeing things kind of going uh, from both your business vantage points? Um, I have a crystal ball and I have a wishing well. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good. Step into both of them. Yeah. (laughs) Um, The the, the crystal ball part, um, the priorities of retailers and consumer goods for 2023 and 2024 are, are pretty clear. Like loyalty programs, personalization, re-commerce, sustainability. These are their priorities and they will be looking for ways to bring Gen AI uh, to help move the needle uh, in those particular strategic objectives that they have. So we'll see a lot of that. Now, my wishing well, <laughs> um, I am looking for, as I mentioned before, disruption in uh, chatbot automation specifically. Uh, I want to have the days where you sit on the phone going through, you know, for for Espanol, press two. Uh, if you have this question, but not that question, press four, and then go back to the menu, like, especially once you work with government agencies and whatnot. So I would like, you know, this disruption to go uh, outside of just retail and completely change the way we interact with, um, customer service, consumer service, uh, in every aspect of our lives. So that's where my hopes are. Um, and, you know, automating menial work is something I also look forward to for Gen AI to kind of take care of. Actually, that's so funny because it turns out that Val and I have the both, both the same wishing wells. Um, <laughs> because when I was looking at, when I was like thinking through this question, the very first thing that popped into mind was all of your automation that you can help with from like your call center perspective. Mm-hmm. And I think that is such an exciting use case. Like, so the first time I was introduced to it was internally at a primo. So our chief information security officer um, trained up a chat bot within our dam on all of our different security policies, compliance docs, and literally within using it, it took 60% because we're a very data-driven org, thanks to our CEO. So they had tracked all this, took 60% of the time and 50% of the labor out of my CISO's uh, part of the organization, just responding to different like compliance requests, security and infosec reviews. And so you think about that when you're translating it over to retail. And if you're training up this chat jo- chat bot to be client facing, A, it's going to help a lot from the perspective of like, um, it's you're not going to be hit with as many calls to your call center. Even your customer success reps, they'll be, they could have like their own list of FAQs that they can quickly search against as well. So it helps from that call center training perspective. Um, but really it's, it allows, if you're making that client facing, it's really allowing 
you to finally, as a brand, meet your client where they are and answer exactly what their question is and get them a way, way better experience when doing so. Um, so I agree with Val. That's like one of the areas I'm most excited about. And then during my Gardner days before I joined a Primo, I was really heavily involved with a lot of like different AR and VR technologies. So purely from like a total geekery perspective, I'm actually really excited to see the ways that people like utilize Gen AI when making digitally advanced in person experiences too. Um, I just think that like sky's a on creativity on that realm. So I, I can't wait to see what people like go about. You feel that it's kind of like, where is that? Uh, around the corner a little bit or? Yeah, no, I think it's kind of, I mean, it's happening. It it's happening. happening. Yeah. yeah. We, we already put, uh, we, we integrated um, LLM with the MetaHumans. It's the, you know, digital humans provided by our uh, one of our uh, partners at um, Epic Games. So you can actually talk to human-like avatar and have a uh, involved so conversation. Cool. And uh, we also found a way to give that person a persona. So you can imagine the world where uh, you take this 3D avatar and um, train them on a data that represents your specific affinity group, like soccer mom from Texas. And you can converse with that avatar and you know, bounce some ideas, try to upsell something or pick up their brain and some topics. So this is happening. Um, really Very really cool. cool. Very cool. That's so cool. Um, Austin, um, what came in? I know there's like, you hit on a couple of topics, which I think are part of our, our follow-up too. So what do you got? Yeah, we got a couple here. Um, first one here, this one's uh, AI generated images can sometimes be tricky. Uh, what is considered state of the art and why do some of these gpt models start hallucinating oh boy <laughs> <laughs> i'll take that it's a it's two loaded question so uh when we talk about uh generative ai for imagery um the state of the art out there is something called stable diffusion models you might have heard of midjourney dolly like uh, yeah there's a zoo of these models right now. Uh, before that, there was a, a different uh, approach. It was called um, generative adver adversary networks, but stable diffusion superseded them. But what's interesting, um, these diffusion models were born when people were trying to reduce the noise in the images. And they just, at some point, they figure out that you can reverse that uh, approach uh, and use it to actually generate images. What um, it wasn't trained to do to actually generate an image to a very specific spec. So it can draw, you know, a Rembrandt look in painting for you, but ask stable diffusion to create a shelf, a retail shelf that has, you know, five boxes on it of a certain dimension. It won't be able to do it just yet. Or, uh, it also has difficulty with, um, generating text that doesn't look funny. So in my mind, those uh, seem like easy operations though, compared to the ramp brain right. example. What's well, yeah. So what it means is that you can use, for example, Dolly to, um, ideate and some product designs, but you're not there yet to ask it to create an actual, you know, product, um, design spec to a T, right. And it cannot do 3d from, from, uh, from text to 3d just yet, but. I know there are a lot of organizations working on it, and I actually can't wait to see this materialize. So that's about diffusion. Uh, hallucination problem in GPT is another interesting one, and I think it's a uh, probably bug or feature question of the year. <laughs> um, you know, the whole point of uh, GPT is to create content, right? And um, sometimes it creates the content that is not actual, but it does create it because that's the task you gave it to, to do. Um, the, you know, the reasons why GPT hallucinates, they typically come from three directions. So one of it is the data it's been trained on. So, you know, as, as you may know, um, there's large language models that were trained by OpenAI uh, and other companies on the, basically on the internet, right? So all the raw information that we had on the internet it's right now in the brain of this uh, large language model so a lot of it will come from actual data quality that was provided 
then the other two reasons is actually the way that GPT uh, or another LLM model generates the response is to ma actual mathematical method uh, will also influence uh, the level of hallucination. And the third reason is the actual prompt um, that you as a user give to the system uh, that it's trying to understand and respond to. So, you know, what do you do with hallucination? It's unavoidable because it's, a, again, it's a feature that looks like a bug or a bug. <laughs> But what you can do and what you absolutely should be doing is you need to work on minimizing it because you can't avoid it entirely. But if you miss minimize hallucination to like, to be less than 1% of responses, I think you did. Is this related though into your, when you said you can't draw like a shelf with five boxes, no, it's, it's that's not going to produce a hallucination. Approach, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they sound like a similar challenges, but it's a, so from a science perspective, two different problems yeah. that yeah. our people are working on solving. Hey, Val, how high level, how are people working to minimize hallucinations as well? The most popular approach uh, is through something called uh, prompt engineering. You work on creating a mechanism to validate certain prompts and help system to actually understand the prompts better. Remember, we had the three reasons why it hallucinates so if the prompt is the reason you fix the prompt if the data is the reason you give it the factual data right and you also build the fallback scenarios um into the final solution so for example let's consider building a, a bot that talks to your employees about vacations and your leave policies or salary guidelines like information you have in those hr pdfs right that are being published so you want to be in control what the bot will be able to say, and you want to make sure that it will avoid what if scenarios like a plague so that you didn't, you know, you didn't have liability in your hands. Yeah. Like if, if somebody asked the question, like, I want to move to um, Alaska and uh, keep my California salary, you don't want to give any response at all. So that's where the prompt engineering comes in. When you, when you get a question like that, you need to trigger the fallback scenario and say, you know what? Um, it's best to route you to a, a human who can help answer this kind of question. So this should be built in into the system um, as like prevention methods uh, for hallucinations as well. But I think, Jeff and Val, thank you so much for expanding on that. Jeff, I think that ties back perfectly to what we're talking about with putting the proper policies in place. Mm -hmm. And so as you're looking at like the different POCs that you want to run with internally, it's likely super important that you like look at the factor of, okay, how could potential hallucinations um, like play a role in, in risk factor with these proof of concepts that we're running? Um, and then to Val's point as well, just like proper prompt analysis that you would want to like expose to your team that's that's running that proof of concept too. Those are two probably the crucial areas that you'd want to think through. We often create like those kind of whitelisted questions, um, the, the ones that are, you know, um, allowed and we also create the list of like prohibited questions that we don't really want to give answers to. So there are different techniques to go to solve this kind of problem. And it, it, the cho the choice of technique really depends on the scale. Yeah. And that's why I keep reminding everybody start with the scale start with the scale in mind because the architectural solution will vary. Yeah, I think too just the kind of echoes in my head right this whole the the task force um, and having experts like yourselves at, at the table, this, the task force isn't like an interest group. Like these are people that are interested in AI. These are people. So they need to have people at that table that understand exactly kind of what you talked about it, but how do you establish the right kind of framework? How would you then troubleshoot if things are working or not working and like prompt engineering? You need some expertise around that, like at that table. I, that, well, one, I think to identify that that would be something that could be you know, something you want to focus on or want to provide, have some attention and then have the expertise there like and elsewhere, ethical questions, all, all sorts of things that you bring up. Like it's non-trivial tasks to set up a, a task force around something that you still all don't really understand, but have a critical or sense of urgency to like, we need to figure this out um, and feeling like we're already behind because it does seem like that in general, like there's a go, go, go. Um, but 
just like you're saying, these are, these are critical kind of showstoppers. Yeah. But again, the disruption is coming. It either you ride it or you get disrupted and, you know, consumer goods and retailers are the ones that actually, you know, they take the lead usually. Yeah. Um, and um, when we work with the clients, you know, we obviously help with the technical tax task force, uh, but there's also a strategy consulting leg out there where we engage with uh, different leadership teams and help them understand implications of using generative AI on their workforce. Because jobs will change, let's be honest. Yeah, they will evolve, sure. right? And uh, when you are a large retailer and you have, you know, huge um, groups of people doing certain um, tasks, like in every country, they get, they ask questions like, well, my job will be here, you know, will robots be here? Mm -hmm. And you, you don't want to... Um, make rush decisions and make people feel uncomfortable, right? So you, you want to study uh, ahead of time the implications that a solution like this may have on your people uh, and the business processes. And that's where like strategy consulting really comes in handy uh, from the very beginning. So we do a lot of this work. I know, I know if you guys are engaging with your clients as well in that kind of regard. Yeah, I think to date, what we've done is have a lot more of like those Gen AI exec briefings. But from to that point, like, I think that's why it's really important to have leadership across the board present for different, like, for different parts of your departments, right? So, like, even internally at a primo, our entire leadership team is constantly looking and pinpointing different, like, low risk, high value use cases. But we also have people that are very much advanced in their understanding of Gen AI and applications to so the far more technical people present that can help advise as well. So whether that comes from an internal task force that you put together or also pulling in that consultative segment, like uh, part of the arm as well, yeah. I think it's important that you have both the business users present so that they're like, because and usually there's a little bit of a learning curve there, right? by also having the technical person present so that they can really talk to you through those different ramifications so that you best understand. So you definitely need yeah. those representations. Yeah, that's really good guidance. I think we have another question, right? Austin, one more maybe? Yeah. Give us a uh, Austin. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I've seen the Composable Heroes campaign on LinkedIn and that personalized AI hero card looked pretty cool. Can you explain what the tech is behind that? And how does it work? Um, how can I make my own card? Cool. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad you saw it. That's great. <laughs> that means our marketing teams are doing their jobs. <laughs> um, that was a really fun uh, project that EPAM and Primo and Content Stack all worked on together. Um, actually, I think uh, we can probably add like a blog link that explains all the different tech behind it as well. Um, but in short, I mean, really, when the Content Stack team approached us on on that uh, proof of concept, what we were looking at is like, what's an application that we can use right now with Gen AI that furthers the output from both of our systems? Um, so it's a really cool experience where you take a picture like of yourself, you put your headshot in, actually Content Stacks Automation Hub routes that out, I think it's to Mid Journey, um, and uses that to transform your image into your own like personal superhero or supervillain. I actually did the supervillain because cyborgs are pretty cool. Um, and with the rise of AI and robots, that just seemed fitting. Um, but after it's then uh, put through via Automation Hub to uh, Mid Journey, that entire experience comes back. It's stored in Primo, pushed out into Content Stack, and you get your own trading card that's uh, that's available for you with your entire backstory based off of your like. Uh, job responsibilities as well. So it's just like a really fun, interesting um, like experience, but it shows the power of Gen AI um, and how it furthers both of these parts of your tech stack as well. Um, so yeah, there's a blog that you can read more about like all the different decision factors that we chose when we were choosing Midjourney over other different image generators. Um, the last question was, oh yeah, how do you get your own? Uh, <laughs> like, well, yeah, we'll link down to that too. Uh, yeah, for sure, because it's a it's a pretty cool Thing to be able to use and you can even like share it around internally it caused a lot of laughs for our team <laughs> i'm sure it did for us as well so we have um these show notes so yeah we'll make sure in the show notes that we can have links to the blog links to how you can create your own trading card um ball and anna thank you so much any other things we'll make sure to put into the show notes any questions you have feel free to reach out to us and uh thank you thanks jeff thanks val it was great thanks for having us 
sure to check out the show notes for relevant links and content. To learn even more about the power of going composable, head to contentstack.com.